restitution of the original plots of land to the two organizations, and if not, why not? If the land has been reallocated, if, B, if the land has been allocated to other developers, and if so, indicate to whom and the purpose thereof, and C, if in addition to the restitution of the land to the said organizations, consideration will be given for compensation to be paid thereto in view of any prejudice caused to meet the cost of construction of their cultural centers. Mr. Speaker, allow me to bid good morning to the Leader of the Opposition and thank him for the question put to me this morning. The House may refer to PQ B438 of 9th May 2023 and to the PNQ of the Leader of the Opposition uh, going back to 23rd of May 2023, which referred to lend lease to socio-cultural organizations in Réduit. The uh, wording of the present PNQ, of course, requires that I should set the context for the issues raised. Now, for recall, the Réduit Triangle, this land refers to the Réduit Triangle, which was made available for development by the acquisition in 2001 by the then government of land from Lonro Sugar Corporation under the so-called Lonro deal. Thereafter, in 2008, in 4, 2004, a planning exercise was carried out to decide what would be done with that land and ensure coherent land use. However, in 2006, under a different government, these planning proposals were reviewed. And the then government granted land to a number of different public and private organizations for purposes that were varied and totally unrelated. For instance, today, the building of the Independent Commission Against Corruption stands in the immediate vicinity of a hospital, whereas land has been attributed for all sorts of different purposes, namely the Electoral Commission Office, the Trade Union Trust Fund, a spiritual complex, a transformer room, a retirement home, the local government service commission, national archives, a, a telephone cellular base station, and as I have already said in this house, such injudicious and haphazard use of state land was not in accordance with the basic principles of land use and planning, and does not serve the public Good does not serve the national interest. In the meantime, the, the region of Réduit has become increasingly central with various developments, including extension of the metro line. Accordingly, in 2021, in line with its mandate to ensure appropriate land use and monitoring of state land leases, my ministry conducted a survey that revealed that out of 24 plots of state land, either leased or vested in the Rejui Triangle, only 11 had been developed, whereas 13 had not. Thereupon, government decided to proceed with a new planning exercise by clustering compatible activities, taking into account, of course, existing buildings and retrieving all, all unused land. There were two exceptions. One was the land vested in the Ministry of Arts and Culture for the setting up of the National Archives and National Library because it had reached a very advanced stage in terms of the procurement exercise. Second uh, exception was the land vested in the Ministry of Education, Tertiary Education, Science and Technology, for the setting up of a planetarium, because that land was not so-called Ilovo land, and it was on the other side 
of the Riviere Cascade. In any event, both projects lie squarely within the scope of an educational hub. Now, the new planning exercise provides that alongside the educational hub should be developed a medical hub together with related services. Now, there were four socio-cultural organizations concerned by retrieval of land. Uh, the Hindi-speaking union, the Indo-Mauritian Catholic Association, the Mauritius Tamil Cultural Center Trust, and the Urdu-speaking union. A number of meetings were held, I believe it was early 2023 or end 2022, by the Prime Minister and or the Minister of Arts and Culture, Cultural Heritage, with these four organizations to explain the rationale of government's decision and to propose their relocation to a new site to be agreed upon by everybody. And all four organizations conveyed their agreement and my ministry proceeded accordingly to retrieve the relevant plots of land in accordance with standard procedures. Subsequently, the Mauritius Tamil Cultural Centre Trust and the Indo-Mauritius Catholic Association changed their stand as regards retrieval of the land. In the meantime, government and my ministry identified various alternative sites which were proposed to all the organizations and eventually a site visit was effected by my colleague, the Minister of Arts and Cultural Heritage, accompanied by representatives of all four organizations because there was an ongoing dialogue. And at that site visit, all four organizations expressed their satisfaction and gave their verbal agreement. The, the alternative site it's very centrally located at Côte d'Or, and this site is now being acquired from Landscope Mauritius Limited by the state. And the agreement was that each of these four sociocultural organizations would be leased a plot of land, the size of which would be no lesser than that which they had, which they held under a lease at the Réduit Triangle. Since then, three uh, of the organizations, namely the Hindi-speaking union, the Mauritius Tamil Cultural Center Trust, and the Urdu-speaking union, have formally conveyed their agreement to the offer made by government. Whereas the Indo-Mauritian Catholic Association has not accepted the offer. Now, as regards part A of the question, the issue of restitu restitution of the original plot of land does not arise and has never arisen for the simple reason that, as I stated, the Ministry of Housing has proceeded with a planning exercise in the national interest and government has agreed to a new planning scheme, if I may um, say so, if I may uh, so term it. Restitution would be tantamount to going back to the status quo ante with all the um, developments there. Re restitution does not arise, the more so as three of the four organizations have already conveyed their agreement to the relocation. As regards part B of the question, the answer is in the negative. As regards part C of the question, the issue of compensation does not arise as no prejudice has been caused to any of the four organizations by virtue of the cancellation of the leases in view of the proposed relocation of a plot of land to each one of them at a new site at Côte d'Or. For recall, 
The leases of the land at Rejui Triangle dates back. In the case of the Mauritius Tamil Cultural Center Trust, to July 2010. In the case of the Indo Mauritian Catholic Association, to February 2013. 14, uh, 11 years ago. And in the case of the Urdu speaking union and the Hindi speaking union, the leases go back to September 2016. It is to be noted that all these leases carried conditions that construction had to start within nine months as from the date of signature of the lease agreement and that condition had not been adhered to. Nonetheless, I would like to remind the House that this government has always been supportive of all religions and cultures and cultural center projects. As a matter of fact, over the last 10 years, the Ministry of Arts and Culture has dispersed has allocated, for instance, no less than 37 million to the one Mauritius Tamil Cultural Center Trust. Government will stand together with sociocultural organizations belonging to all religions to assist them in the furtherance of their projects. Now, in the precise case of Kodo, and the sociocultural organizations that have agreed to be relocated there. Uh, firstly, let me stress that Kodo is deemed even more appropriate in view of the surroundings for the activities of these four organizations and the development of cultural centers. Secondly, uh, while the state is in the process of acquiring that land, which belongs to Lenscope. Lenscope has already um, embarked upon works to develop the land. Right now, work is ongoing. The site has been cleared, survey of site has been completed, and excavation works are in progress. Government will come in, and this was decided a long time ago. Government has, is coming in to ensure that all the basic infrastructure is in place. Road access, infrastructure for provision of water and electricity, including street lighting and all the drain infrastructure. That is already ongoing. The work has been contracted out and is proceeding smoothly. For and then we're looking to an early completion of that work. Thereafter, and again, this was decided quite a while ago by government, government will construct on behalf of each of these organizations we have mentioned, namely the Hindi-speaking union, the Mauritius Tamil Cultural Center Trust, and the Urdu-speaking union, a cultural center at its own cost. This testifies to this government's unprecedented and sincere commitment to support all religions, all communities, all cultural centers in this country in the interests of peace, stability, and shared development for all the people of Mauritius. Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, Tamil community and the Indo-Mauritian Catholic community will be extremely disappointed, as I am, that it has not been seen fit, government has not seen it fit to restitute, to return the land that has been granted to them previously. The minister, the deputy prime minister referred to the land being undeveloped. Is he now aware, has he looked at the file now, as opposed to last PNQ, to see that, inst for instance, for IMCA, it was his very ministry 
that refused planning clearance for the, for the IMCA to go ahead with the construction, and then his ministry has to cheek to take the land back because there has been no construction. And I have the dates, and I can table the documents. Mr. Speaker, I hope we're not going to have a repeat of the P&Q of 23rd May of 2023, when exactly the same points were made. So let me first recall that land development did not occur on any one of the four sites. We're talking of the four sociocultural organizations. Secondly, as regards the Indo-Mauritian Catholic Association, an association with which I am very well acquainted with, there it has never been brought to my attention, despite several meetings I have had with the uh, persons responsible for that organization, that there was planning, any planning clearance in abeyance at the Ministry of Housing. Uh, that is a fact which I am stating here in Parliament. Now, uh, in early 2023, I remember meeting the President and Executive Committee members of LIMCA. We explained to them the rationale for this project and why we wanted a coherent, orderly development for our country and such is the mission of my ministry and they were in wholehearted agreement. It was the same agreement that they indeed conveyed to the Prime Minister. And they even, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I, Mr. Speaker, I do not have any control over the question put by the Leader of the Opposition, the manner, the wording, the phrasing and the length, and I have the same liberty to phrase my answers as I so wish. That is normal parliamentary procedure. Right, and so what I was saying is that I met again and again, Imka. They requested assistance as regards additional land in the east of the country, which we promised to look into. Of course, had there been requests for planning clearance before this exercise was embarked upon, it might have been considered. But once this, this exercise was initiated, the priority was relocation, and beyond relocation, this government is going further than any government has done before in terms of extending, and I've just given the details, concrete, concrete help, concrete assistance to construct cultural centers. And if Limka wishes to join the other three organizations, certainly gov government will consider. Now, you have taken a year from the last PNQ to come up with this, no doubt, because your speeches are too long. Now, I'm going to refer you to two letters that Imka have sent. One on 15th of April 2019, one another one follow up on 25th June 2020, pleading, pleading to your ministry for... Uh, uh, for uh, 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 planning clearance. And you say that IMGA has agreed to your plan. I refer and I will table a letter, a, a tough letter sent on 10th May 2023, signed by the General Secretary and the National President of IMCA, where, believe it or not, they talk about genocide under the Geneva Convention. This is the letter I will table it. So you are saying you have any record that IMCA has agreed to this land? Let the minister reply. Wait. But, but before I respond, could I have the date of the second letter mentioned? June 2020. You don't, you don't, you're not on top of this fire. No comments. Mr. Speaker, I will not respond to insults. That is not my manner of proceeding. And uh, I will not dare suggest that the leader of the opposition is not on top of his file, although he is offering us a mere repetition of what was stated in May of last year. 
Now, um, firstly, uh, in April 2019, I was not at the Ministry of Housing and Lands and was never made aware of the existence of such a letter. Likewise, I have not seen a letter of June 2020 and have never been made aware of it. But, but, let me insist once again, I personally met with the president and executive members of INCA at my office at the Ministry of Housing in Eben in a very cordial atmosphere and we discussed all the issues and activities pertaining to IMCA. And never was a matter of planning clearance at Reggie raised. Had it been raised, as holds true for any sociocultural organization on leased state land, it would have been given due consideration. Now, let me go further to state that the letter of May 2023, with the language referred to uh, by the uh, association, of course, came to the knowledge of government, and uh, I will let the public judge. Mr. Speaker, these organizations cannot uh, uh, be victims of the disorganization, apparent disorganization of your ministry, where you're not aware before responding to one or two PNQs what actually has happened in your ministry. These people cannot be the victims of this disorganization. And Mr. Speaker, I will table these letters for the knowledge of the Deputy Prime Minister because his ministry took the, the land back because it had not been constructed upon, whereas it is your own fault. It was not constructed upon. Mr. Speaker, the land had not been constructed upon in the case of all four organizations over a period stretching over, we said, 2010 up until 2016, up to 2024. That is a fact. But the land was retrieved because, most importantly, there was a newer survey and a new planning exercise. We can talk and talk and talk over for many PNQs. The same PNQ as this one can be asked over and over again. The facts remain that all four organizations were not able to build. This government not only is proposing relocation to a more appropriate site, is laying down all the infrastructure, and furthermore, is embarking upon the unprecedented gesture, it's more than a gesture, action of constructing cultural centers for the Hindi-speaking union, the Indo-Mauritian Catholic Association, the Mauritius Tamil Cultural Center Trust, the Urdu Speaking Union. Never before has any government put its words to action and shown its commitment to supporting the cultural development, the cultural centers of all the components of the Mauritian population. One year ago, I asked the same Deputy Prime Minister whether he would help financially these cultural centers, and he categorically refused. And now on the eve of the election, haha, suddenly, <laughs> suddenly, <laughs> the money is found. Honorable Leader of the Opposition, no, don't show me your hand, don't show me your hand. This is disrespect. I am asking you to put your questions. Don't make comments. On the eve of the election, suddenly, now, government comes up with that money. What is saying, when he is saying, I am, I am fin Put your question, last time. I will put my question. What's the matter with you? The matter is with you. I will put my question. Now, I want to ask the Honorable Deputy Prime Minister. 
He's saying that the Mauritius Tamil Cultural Center Trust agreed. Whereas we all know that the community itself and the Mauritius Tamil Temples Federation have never agreed. Is he aware that all the, bo all the board members, all of them, of the Mauritius Tamil Center, uh, Cultural Center Trust are appointed by the Minister of Culture and furthermore, a large number of them are civil servants. These people cannot be said reply. to represent the Tamil community or any community because in fact, all they do is they represent government because they are civil servants. Mr. Speaker, once a year, the leader of the opposition wakes up and is suddenly concerned with the Mauritius Tamil Cultural Centre Trust and the Indo-Mauritian Catholic Association. Once a year. The last PNQ dates back to almost a year. The, the leader of the opposition, as opposed to the example of several members of the opposition, has not been involved in the demagoguery we have heard. And I had hoped that he would maintain the same standards today. Let me again respond to him that since May 2023, this government has not remained inactive, has not remained with its arms folded. We have moved very concretely since that time to identify together with the four socio-cultural organizations the land where they would be relocated. Proposals had been made for La Vigie. Proposals had been made for, I believe, land in the region of Hermitage. It was only when the four organizations in the presence of the Minister of Arts and Culture gave their agreement and said they were happy and satisfied that we could then, in a consensual manner, embark upon the, this project in a concrete manner. As soon as that was decided, Action was taken to verify that the land was appropriate for the building of a cultural center. Discussions embarked upon with Lenscope for the acquisition of the land. Tendering procedures undertaken and a con contract allocated by Lenscope for the work to be done. And right now, my colleague, the Minister of Arts and Culture, is in the process of meeting with these organizations, or at least the three of them, to agree upon the precise location of the plots which will be attributed to each one of the three. So why one can either talk and wake up once a year to do some new talking, or one can act, and this government is acting decisively is acting decisively to support all cultural centers. The DPM says decisive action after 12 whole months have gone past and it takes a PNQ to get, to get the truth out of you. And Mr. Speaker, I'd like to ask the Honorable Minister whether he hasn't replied to the question. When the government is talking to the Moshe Tamil, Tamil Cultural Center, they're in fact talking to themselves because they are talking to civil servants and no civil servant is going to go against the instructions of a prime minister or even a deputy prime minister. I'd like to ask the honorable minister now whether money is not everything. There's also integrity, honesty and dignity. Whether he will now apologize for having said, having called these, uh, these venerable persons usual troublemakers and their project Again, Mr. Speaker, it pains me. This is not just any leader of the opposition. It is somebody whom I respect and who has got us accustomed to other standards of debate in this house. That he should now share in the same demagoguery that, that other members of the opposition do really pains me. 
And let me say, let me respond to what has been said. And I, and I, and I, uh, and I thought the leader of the opposition would not share in the demagoguery I'm now hearing from others on the opposition side. And you can hear them. And you can hear them as well as I do. Order. 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 And I do. And the, these members can put their parliamentary questions order. instead order. of order. 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 I've said order everywhere. Order. Both sides of the house. Hmm. Order! Order both sides of the house! Last time! Order both sides of the house! Last time! Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition says it's taken a year for the truth to be stated. I don't know what truth he's being referred to, referring to. We have all stated the truth. What was the state of the land? Who gave that land away in such a manner? What the project was to go back to planning principles? How the retrieval of land concerned not one or two organization, but 13 different plots of land, including ministries, including the Prime Minister's office, including private sector organizations, including NGOs of different types. So it's not one, it's not two associations, but 13 plots of land having been retrieved. Let this truth be known to the nation beyond the sly innuendos and the defamatory remarks of the opposition. Firstly, the truth is that the whole of the Réduit Triangle area has been looked at afresh with a new planning exercise. Secondly, the leader of the opposition refers to this cultural centre trust with uh, civil servants and so on. Now, when were these centres set up? This was set up between 2000 and 2005 by the MSM, MMM government. And we are proud of that. And since then, they have done the work, their work, for the promotion of cultural development of everybody in this country. They have been supported by government. And government has worked hand in hand with organized, these organizations. I don't know whether the leader of the opposition is against is against cultural centers and cultural center trust. If that be the case, he should say so. He should say so. Because, because, Mr. Speaker, the, what does he call them, eminent, venerable leader of the opposition has been in government since 2005. And to my knowledge, after 2005, never has he come forward to propose the change or the abolition of cultural center trusts. These cultural centers exist. We are proud that we brought them into existence and we will go on working with them just as we work with all religions and socio-cultural organizations of all religions. Now, let me, let me go back the truth. I am, I am, I'm blamed by the leader of the opposition by speaking of usual troublemakers. Everybody in this country knows, everybody in this country knows that this matter has been politicized, has been politicized just to score cheap political points, even, even if it has meant even if it has meant threatening the stability and the social community spirit of the population of Mauritius. And this is not the first time.
the opposition does so. And secondly, the, 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 there's a campaign that the minister would have termed the uh, project of the Tamil Cultural Trust, Galimatia. That is not what was said, and they know full well, and the leader of the opposition first. The term Galimatia was used to say that when there is no urban planning, take any, any area of the country, any area of the country, if you allow, as did the government after 2005, and my, my friends from the MMM will note what I'm saying, we put in place between 2000 and 2005 planning guidelines so that activities that emerge would be compatible. There will be an orderly, coherent development. After 2006, they did the contrary so that you have haphazard development. That is what was referred to. And now we are seeking to bring back some coherence in terms of development of land. That is the mandate of my ministry, and that is what we're doing, not only in Reggie, but across the country, to look at state leases that are not being utilized, state land that is not being productively used. That is the work of government. We are doing and work our work, we are supporting cultural centers, and the population will judge. Time over by six minutes. Prime Minister, question time. Honorable members, the table has been advised that PQB 90 will be replied by the Honorable Minister of Information, Technology, Communication, and Innovation. PQB 157 will be replied by the Honorable Prime Minister, time permitting. I now call Honorable Dulab. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. B82. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, sir, as I have already stated in this house previously, the socio-economic development of Agalega had been neglected for far too long, and the needs and aspirations of its inhabitants had been receiving little attention, leaving them with a bare minimum for their subsistence. However, with the realization under my government of the two major infrastructural development projects mentioned by the honorable member, namely the airstrip and the new jetty, the stage is now set for Agalega to embark on a transformative journey towards a better and brighter future for the Agaligans and their children. In regard to these two projects in question, it is a fact that the state of the old airstrip, which was constructed in the early 80s, had worsened over time to such an extent that landing and takeoff of the Donia aircraft had become a challenging exercise in view of the serious risks for the aircraft, its crew members, and passengers. Only some patching works had been undertaken in 1999, but that also did not last long. Thereafter, from 2003 onwards, some attempts had been made to upgrade the airstrip, but to no avail. The state of the airstrip continued to deteriorate for lack of repair and maintenance. With each landing and takeoff of the Donier, both the aircraft and the airstrip sustained damages. So much so that a decision had to be taken by the Department of Civil Aviation to limit flying to Agalega only for urgent medical evacuation and which was restricted to daytime only. The old jetty, which is 60 meters long, was constructed in 1985 and is in a very bad condition, despite repairs that were effected over the years. Moreover, the old jetty could not allow ships to berth, as such embarkation 
and disembarkation of passengers and goods had to be made via barges. Ships like MV Troquetia had to lay in anchor at some 400 meters away from the jetty at the St. James Anchorage located at a reef-free area where the minimum depth of 60 meters was available. Not only that, in certain past voyages, MV Troquetia could not even anchor and had to be kept on the drive for both embarkation and disembarkation of goods and passengers in the high sea due to bad weather conditions, resulting in greater risks, delays, and additional financial costs. Access to the island by air and by sea, therefore, remained severely constrained because of the poor state of the airstrip and the jetty. Mr. Speaker, sir, on acceding to power in 2014, the then government promised to ensure that the needs and requirements of our fellow citizens of Agalega were catered for. The government program 2015-2019 further provided as follows, and I quote, government will equip Agalega with appropriate amenities, including an airstrip and a new jetty to improve accessibility and connectivity. In view of its specificity, the use of renewable energy will be promoted there." Unquote. Mr. Speaker, sir, following consultations between the government of Mauritius and the government of India, a memorandum of understanding for the improvement in sea and air transportation facilities at Agaliga was signed during the visit of His Excellency Sri Narendra Modi, Prime Minister of the Republic of India, to Mauritius in March 2015. The realization of these two major infrastructural development projects in Agaliga is yet another testimony of this long-standing relationship of mutual benefits and trust between our two countries. These projects will go a long way towards improving the air and sea access to the island and contribute significantly to improving the standard of living of our Agalegan brothers and sisters as well as also broaden the scope of economic activities in Agaliga. In addition, the implementation of these projects will also cater to the future development needs of Agaliga, as well as implementation of measures to promote, protect, and safeguard our maritime security needs in the following areas, amongst others, one, surveillance and monitoring of our vast EEZ of 2.3 million square kilometers, two, counter piracy, counter terrorism, counter narcotics and human trafficking, three, controlling poaching and illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing, Four, provision of hydrographic services. Five, promoting economic development, including blue economy initiatives. Six, emergency response, including search and rescue. Seven, marine pollution response. And eight, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief activities. Mr. Speaker, sir, the actual works on these two main projects started in October 2018. However, 
mobilization of resources and progress of work were severely affected by the challenging sea conditions which pose serious difficulties in the supply of construction material to the island. It must be pointed out that the projects involve a significant amount of mobilization of plant, machineries, and equipment, such as barges, tugs, dumpers, batching plants, pavers, sewage treatment plant, desalination plants, amongst others. This is exclusive of accommodation that had to be constructed for workers, workshops, and medical facilities at site. Later, the, unforeseen, the unforeseeable circumstances created by the COVID-19 pandemic had also severely impacted the project and resulted in decrease in work progress due to inability to mobilize manpower with required skills as well as construction materials, which led, in fact, to considerable delay in the realization of those projects. Mr. Speaker, sir, I must also point out that the Agalega Infrastructural Development Project included surface dressing of the existing airstrip. As I said earlier, the coral bed airstrip is a primitive structure with periodic peeling off of debris due to the impact of landing aircrafts. Accordingly, an additional layer of surface dressing was applied over the entire airstrip, which was thereafter compacted with rollers to ensure the free debris were arrested. In addition, as a standard operating practice, inspection and compacting was ensured as and when required before every emergency sortie of Dornier to Agalega to ensure safer landing and takeoff and avoid any damage to the aircraft. Mr. Speaker, sir, the new airstrip is three kilometer long and 45 meters wide in north-south orientation. Unlike the existing airstrip, the new airstrip is an all-weather concrete airstrip with capabilities for day and night landing. This material intensive project required mobilization of a large quantum of construction materials. All civil works of the airstrip, including taxiway and apron, have been completed. The works on associated infrastructure, such as air traffic control tower, firefighting services, passenger terminal building, aircraft hangar, and electrical substation were also severely impacted due to COVID-19 pandemic. But these works have also been completed, except for certain peripheral works like navigation, meteorological equipment, which are expected to be completed by December 2024. Trial landings during daytime had been undertaken successfully by the Dornier aircraft and the ATR-72 in March 2023 and in February 2024, respectively. I would also like to point out that the new airstrip will allow night flights. Mr. Speaker, sir, in regard to the new jetty, I am informed that this was the more complicated aspect of the project with work interface at the sea. However, despite the several challenges, all works related to the new jetty have been completed, and this jetty would be able to accommodate up to three ships at a time. Inaugural berthing of both MV Troquetia 
and CGS Barracuda were undertaken during the inauguration of the new jetty. Mr. Speaker, sir, following the 2019 general elections, new government renewed its commitment to develop the island and optimize its economic potential with the establishment of the new jetty and airstrip. In this regard, in spite of the setback caused by COVID-19 pandemic, which impacted heavily on the implementation schedule, the government of Mauritius extended its full support for the timely realization of the project. Mr. Speaker, sir, the House will be aware that I visited Agalega from 29th February to 2nd of March 2024 for the inauguration of the new airstrip, the new jetty, and six other small development projects jointly with His Excellency Sri Narendra Modi, Prime Minister of the Republic of India, who was live from New Delhi. The official delegation comprised inter alia five ministers, namely the Vice Prime Minister, Minister of Local Government and Disaster Risk Management, the Minister of Environment, Solid Waste Management and Climate Change, the Minister of Information Technology, Communication and Innovation, the Minister of Blue Economy, Marine Resources, Fisheries and Shipping, and the Minister of Youth Empowerment, Sports and Recreation. Three members of the National Assembly, representing constituency number three, Port Ruiz Maritime and Port Ruiz East, two parliamentary private secretaries, the High Commissioner of the Republic of India, senior government officials, representatives from five private press, the Mauritius Broadcasting Corporation and the Government Information Service. All these costs, all the costs, including travel and accommodation, were borne by government. <clears throat> the Honorable Leader of the Opposition was also invited to form part of the delegation, but his secretariat subsequently informed my office that he would not be joining the delegation. Honorable Shakil Mohamed also did not turn up despite being invited. The inauguration ceremony was held on Thursday, 29th of February, 2024, at 11.30 hours and was at attended by a large number of Ag Agaligans. His Excellency, Sri Narendra Modi and I jointly unveiled the e plaques for the following projects. The new airstrip, the new jetty, and six other small development projects. Mr. Speaker, sir, these six small projects are the following. One, construction of a library with computers and IT infrastructure. The project has been implemented on the North Island in village Bensaik to cater to the needs of both school go goers as well as the local residents. It is also equipped with four computers with internet connection. Two, construction of a larger shop. The project has been implemented on the North Island in village Vincent to provide a fully air conditioned larger shop with better storage conditions. Three, construction of an office come administrative quarters on South Island. The project has been implemented on the South Island in village Saint Rita as the South Island did not have an appropriate administrative office, as well as the existing shop is small and old. This building also has an earmarked area which will function as community center for South Island. Four, 
construction of fish landing station. The project has been implemented on the North Island at Lafourche. The purpose of the fish landing station is to facilitate and promote fishing activities in Agalega. Five, construction of a community come multipurpose hall. The project has been implemented on the North Island in Village 25. It consists of the construction of a building to accommodate a community come multipurpose hall for social activities. Six, two kiosks at both alighting points on both North and South Islands. The project consists of the construction of one kiosk at La Pointe on the North Island and one kiosk at La Pointe on the South Island to provide shelter for passengers waiting to boat. Mr. Speaker, sir, all these infrastructural development projects have been entirely financed by the government of India. I again express my deepest gratitude to His Excellency Sri Narendra Modi and the government of the Republic of India for their generous and valuable support in the socio-economic development of Agaliga. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, sir, one of the most visible and valuable benefit of the new JT project is that all disembarkation, unloading, and embarkation, loading operations are now being undertaken in much safer conditions. The House will recall that formerly all such operations were undertaken on the high sea with all its inherent risks and difficulties. Furthermore, all those operations are now taking much less time as it used to before. Mr. Speaker, sir, these projects have indeed translated my vision and that of my government to spearhead development in every single part of our territory into a reality. In my speech at the inauguration ceremony, I stated that the quality of life of our Agalegan brothers and sisters will improve as these projects will generate significant economic activities and employment opportunities for both the North and the South Islands. I again reassured everybody, especially the Agalegans, that there has never been any agenda to transform Agalega into a military base. I note, however, that in spite of the reassurance given, the opposition, members, some members of the opposition here, are continuing their campaign of disinformation and instilling fear and doubts in the minds of the people. They are still raising questions about the length of the new airstrip, which according to them is too long. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, sir, the length of the airstrip is commensurate with the objectives of these facilities, which I enumerated earlier. As I mentioned, the delegation which proceeded to Agalega also included five members of the private press who had reached Agalega on 27th of February 2024, that is two days prior to the inauguration ceremony. Therefore, they had had ample time to visit every nook and corner of both North and South Islands. I must say that none of their post-visit reports have confirmed any of the allegations, accusations, and insinuations that the opposition had been making against the projects both outside and inside the National Assembly. Mr. Speaker, sir, the two members from the opposition who were in Agalega as part of the delegation were also 
totally free to move around and see for themselves the projects being implemented on the island. The leaders of the parties in the opposition could have asked those two members whether they have seen the underwater tunnels or whether they had seen any submarines, warplanes or warships which they had been talking about in the local media at a certain point in time. I must say that it is only the opposition here in Mauritius that is distilling all sorts of rumors on the Agalega projects. Most of the people of Agalega have in fact welcomed the realization of these projects. I would invite the opposition to listen to the speech of the resident manager of Agalega at the inauguration ceremony. In fact, in his speech, the acting resident manager, Mr. Emmanuel Jasper, conveyed on behalf of the inhabitants of Agalega his heartfelt gratitude to the government of India for its tremendous support and assistance extended to Agaliga. He also thanked the government to have kept the development of Agaliga high on its agenda and indicated that the dream of Agaligans for better connectivity and a better standard of living has been realized. He also mentioned the new relations and friendship between the inhabitants of Agaliga and the people of India through the project monitoring team, the staff of AFCONS and RIGHTS, and other technical specialists. Monsieur le Président, durant ma visite à Agaliga, j'ai eu l'occasion de constater, de visu, le potentiel de développement qu'offre l'île, et surtout, le retard à être rattrapé dans différents secteurs tels que la télécommunication, le logement, l'éducation, la santé, la pêche et d'autres. Durant ma visite, j'ai aussi eu l'occasion de rencontrer les représentants des Agaléens qui en ont fait quelques propositions, précisément dans le domaine de la santé, l'éducation et la formation, afin de continuer à améliorer la qualité de la vie des Agaléens. Monsieur le Président, avec la réalisation de ces deux projets majeurs qui vont grandement améliorer l'accès aérien et maritime, nous allons certainement pouvoir adresser les préoccupations des Agaléens avec beaucoup plus d'efficacité. Mr. Speaker, sir, regarding the interaction with the representatives of the Agalean community, of the North and the South Islands. I have requested my office to ensure the necessary follow-up on the issues raised by them. I must point out that a committee at the level of my office is currently working on a master plan for the development of Agaliga. The committee will work in collaboration with all the ministries concerned and the OIDC to ensure that all issues, including those raised during my visit, are addressed, namely implementation of mitigation measures against beach erosion, protection of historical monuments, provision of sports facilities, development of fishing, upgrading of health services, boosting food crops and livestock production, improving fire and rescue service, enhancement of educational facilities, improvement of land transport facilities, improvement of internet and mobile connectivity, construction of housing units and maintenance of existing units and staff quarters, and employment opportunities and training. Mr. Speaker, sir, Coconut oil extraction being one of the main activities on the island. I am informed that one new coconut oil extraction machine has been generously provided by rights under its corporate social responsibility program. The new machine has already been delivered on site 
and will be installed shortly. In addition, the OIDC is in the process of procuring another new coconut oil extraction machine, which is expected to be delivered and installed in two months' time. Moreover, the OIDC is working on a project for further exploitation of coconut byproducts. Mr. Speaker, sir, I have also heard queries regarding operation of commercial flights to Agaliga. I wish to reiterate what I said during my press statement in Agaliga on 1st of March 2024. Proper planning and consultations need to be carried out with all relevant stakeholders for the airstrip to become operational for commercial flights. In addition to financial viability, there are several technical and operational requirements that need to be catered for to ensure the smooth operation of commercial flights. Mr. Speaker, sir, I am informed by the Director of Civil Aviation and the management of Air Mauritius that, at present, the core facilities are available and same have already been published in the Aeronautical Information Publication Supplement. However, there are certain other requirements that need to be looked into. I am also informed by the Director General of Immigration that in accordance with Sections 2 and 22.1 of the Immigration Act of 2022, the terminal at Agaliga will have to be declared a port of entry to enable it to operate as such. Mr. Speaker, sir, all these requirements are being examined at the level of the committee I just mentioned, and subsequently, recommendations will be made on the way forward. In regard to staffing of the new facilities, the committee at the level of my office is currently working on the operational requirements, including manpower deployment. Appropriate provisions will be made in the coming budget for those operational requirements from the Mauritian side. I must point out here that the airstrip and the jetty will be vested in the Mauritius Police Force, which will have full control of these facilities. However, the Government of India will assist the Government of Mauritius in the operation and maintenance of the facilities, particularly in scarcity areas. Obviously, the human resource requirements will evolve over time. As I said, we do not foresee the start of commercial flights anytime soon, as this will depend on the viability of such flights and the availability of proper and adequate accommodation and ground handling services. Mr. Speaker, sir, the setting up of this new airstrip and jetty facilities in Nagalega is the fulfillment of yet another Mauritian dream, which many generations have cherished in their hearts. However, the realization of such a mega project at 1,100 kilometers away from mainland Mauritius was a daunting challenge indeed. And I must say that the realization of these projects would not have been possible without the support and assistance of the Government of India. Let me restate in no uncertain terms that the agreement signed between the Government of Mauritius and the Government of India satisfy the principles of mutual benefit as well as that of being in strict compliance with the sacrosanct principles of sovereignty and territorial integrity. There is no doubt that with the new facilities in Agaliga, there is a huge potential for developing economic activities on the islands while preserving its ecosystems. 
as is the case for Rodrigues, and eventually the Chagos Archipelago, the socio-economic development in Nagalega will contribute to increasing wealth creation in our republic, but more importantly, will ensure that none of our fellow citizens living in our outer islands are left behind while the republic cruises towards a better and brighter future. Thank you. Time is over. I can't allow you to be Time is over. Questions B92, B94 have been withdrawn. Question to other ministers. Honourable members, the table has been advised that PQB 107 will be replied by the Honourable Minister of Youth Empowerment, Sports and Recreation. B110 will be replied by the Honourable Minister of Land, Transport and Light Rail. PQB 121 will be replied by the Honourable Minister of National Infrastructure and Community Development. I will now call on Honourable Kirin. B99. Mr. Speaker, sir, with regard to public concerts and other cultural events, my ministry had several meetings with representatives of l'Association L'Union des Artistes and events organizers to address inter alia this issue. Mr. Speaker, sir, with regard to part A of the question, I wish to inform the House that l'Association L'Union des Artistes had at a meeting held at my ministry on the 21st December 2023 in the presence of the representatives of the police department, submitted a list of five proposed sites, namely Domain VIP Business Park, Richter Business Park, Domain Set Cascade, Medin Football Pitch, Côte d'Or, and Domain Saint-Aubin. The Commissioner of Police has, after carrying out site visits at these five sites, informed my ministry recently that only two of them, namely Côte d'Or and Domaine Set Cascade, have been found conducive for the holding of public concerts and other cultural events. As regards the holding of public concerts at the Anjale Kupen Stadium, I will refer the answer to the other PQ coming down uh, afterwards. Mr. Speaker, sir, with regard to part B of the question, Seven meetings have been held with representatives of L'Association Union des Artistes and professional events organizers on the 17th of July 2023, 27th October 2023, 21st, 26th and 28th December 2023, 26th February 2024 and on the 20th March 2024. Mr. Speaker, sir, as regards part C of the question, as mentioned earlier, in reply to another PQ, uh, B1727, on the same issue, the holding of public concerts is regulated by the Public Gathering Act 1991 and other applicable legislations. Accordingly, necessary clearances have to be sought and obtained from the competent authorities prior to authorization be given for the holding of concerts and cultural events. It must be emphasized, Mr. Speaker, sir, that the organization of musical concerts has not been prohibited by government, but of course, appropriate clearances are required for same from the relevant authorities. Monsieur le Président, je dois faire ressortir que l'honorable ministre avait pris l'engagement qu'il avait promis de prendre les choses en main et que rapidement son ministère allait venir avec un one-stop shop qui allait permettre aux artistes, aux organisateurs d'événements, de voir la lumière au bout du tunnel. Mais le Nord ministre peut-il nous dire pourquoi pratiquement une année, malgré toutes les rencontres, les réunions qui ont eu lieu entre lui et les artistes et les organisateurs de concerts, aucune solution n'a été trouvée et aucune proposition concrète faite aux artistes et aux professionnels event organizers à ce jour. Mr. Speaker, sir, firstly, the question do not, does not relate to one-stop shop. The question relates to sites, appropriate sites for holding of concerts. So my 
answer is limited to the question. Coming to various meetings being held, of course, it does take time, Mr. Speaker, sir, because when we're talking about public concerts, we're talking about cultural events, so many other authorities are concerned, so many other authorities are involved. And as I mentioned, we had a very constructive meeting where proposals were tabled in terms of where we can have, we can hold concerts. The Commissioner of Police has recommended certain sites, which I mentioned. There is also the Anjali Kupen Stadium that is being considered. So, Mr. Speaker, sir, it is very wrong to say that nothing is being done. And uh, also, as I said, government has never prohibited the organization of concerts. It's a matter of getting the right clearances. And the one-stop shop, we, I mentioned, we are working on it. We will come forward. But at no point, at no point does that hinder the organization of concert. One example, Mr. Speaker, sir, for instance, following an application made by Ecos Production, there is a concert being held on the 6th and the 7th of April uh, 2024 by Prophecy and other artists. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, it's very wrong to say that nothing is being done or that the concerts are not being organized. Yeah une politique de deux poids, deux mesures dans l'octroi de PMI par Hello, les autorités. Honorable Mandeur, calm yourself. The minister just said the question should be linked to the main question. So this is a comment. This is an opinion you're making. Put a question. Put your question. I will do it. I will do it. Comme je disais, Monsieur le Président, certains concerts sont autorisés, d'autres pas. Le ministre a-t-il été informé que certains, je le dis bien, certains ripoux se font grassement payer afin de faciliter les formalités d'usage qui, dans certains cas, prennent des mois En est-il au courant Mr. Speaker, sir, these are very serious allegations and warrant a proper complaint to the, to the police. So rather than Asking me that question, if the Honorable Member has information, if he has information... So let, me, let me put the question straight forward. Can you substantiate what you just said in Parliament? If this goes to the court, you have to say the same thing that you say here now. Can you, Honorable Kirin, can you... Please, I am talking. Can you substantiate the, alleg the allegation you just made in Parliament right now? Yes or no? I'm asking a question to the no, Honourable no, no, no. Minister. No, no. Don't run away. Don't, don't run away. Don't run away. Don't, don't run away. Quiet. Quiet. There is only one. There is only one MP Kiren. And there is only one question. So, I reiterate my question. Can you substantiate? I'm the one who has no, I, If you can't substantiate, I disallow the question. So, you can't substantiate, I disallow the question. I am asking you, can you substantiate on the allegation against the police? If you can substantiate, I will allow the question. If you can't substantiate, I disallow the question. So you can't substantiate and disallow the question. Let's continue. B100. Mr. Speaker, sir, the village of Bichtombu, which comprises a geographical area of 7.2 kilometers square with around 15,000 inhabitants, has experienced various residential, commercial, and industrial developments during the past years leading to a higher standard of living in that region. Mr. Speaker, sir, I'm informed that the Road Development Authority, that currently the traffic flow along Beige Tombu B29 is quite high, with a huge percentage of vehicles, including heavy ones, using the road. In fact, the road consists of several bends, two of which are located before and after the existing Brinical Bridge. These bends represent a safety hazard to road users due to visibility problems and, traffic, and contribute to traffic congestion in the region. 
Mr. Speaker, sir, the Brunical Bridge, which is of a width of six meters, was constructed in the year 1926 with reinforced concrete and masonry. It consists of a poor structure and there is a lack of pedestrian facility, thereby constituting a potential traffic hazard impeding the traffic flow of heavy vehicles in both directions of the roads. I am advised that the Traffic Management and Road Safety Unit, the TMISU, that during morning and afternoon peak hours, traffic queuing is observed along B29 and B33 to exit the motorway M2. Additional traffic congestion may arise due to vehicle breakdowns, road crashes, road works, and several vehicles are waiting for right turn onto public areas. In addition, very few alternative routes exist in order to redirect congested traffic. Mr. Speaker, sir, with a view to addressing the issues I have mentioned, the RDA is currently realigning the road B29 over a distance of 700 meters so as to improve visibility, traffic flow, and minimizing risk of accidents thereat. Moreover, compared to the existing six meter bridge, a new bridge of 11 meters is being constructed, comprising of two lanes of width 3.5 meters each and footpath on both sides of the bridge of two meters each, so as to improve traffic flow and pedestrian movement in Bridge Tombu. The actual Brinical Bridge will thereafter be used by pedestrians only. Works have been started on 26 April 2023 and have reached 70% and is expected to be completed in May 2024. Mr. Speaker, sir, I'm further informed that the TMISU is proposing to implement the following measures to improve traffic flow at Beach Tombu. Installation of a set of traffic signal equipment during next financial year, adjunction of uh, Beach Tombu B29 and Richter B23 in order to improve traffic flow and road safety thereat. <coughs> Restricting on street parking near busy and poor visibility intersections to help reduce traffic congestion. Converting one on street bus stop into levies along congested traffic stretches subject to sufficient land being available. Improving public bus service to encourage model shift from private car to buses. Extending the road decongestion program to the coquetry and Richter roundabouts at Beach Tombu and increasing the presence of police officers to help ease traffic congestion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sir, can the Honourable Minister inform the House whether the possibility is being envisaged to construct a great separated junction at Coquetry Runabout, similar to the one that has been constructed Mr. Speaker, sir, uh, currently we've, uh, with the uh, coming into operation of the KD flyover, we are now constructing the flyover at Terre Rouge. So we will wait uh, to see what are the incidents of the traffic on the uh, Beach Tombo roundabout before deciding of a flyover because of the high cost involved. Uh, in our opinion, we think that uh, we might not need a flyover at this stage. Bridge Tombo might need some minor improvement, maybe like adding another lane to improve the traffic flow toward Terre Rouge, where then the traffic will go through the flyover toward the north. So we'll wait, analyze the situation, and then we'll decide accordingly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, honorable members, I suspend your sitting at this stage for one and a half hours.